Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning for our third day of the Circling the Arctic Conference. My name is Alexandra Mai, and I am a senior fellow with the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law, one of the organiz organizers of this conference. We are partnered in this endeavor with the Annenberg Public Policy Center, also known as APPC, and the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center. And we are immensely grateful for all that they've done to support this conference. Sorrel is a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to the preserving and promoting uh, rule of law in the 21st century uh, in the context of national security, warfare, and democratic governance. Sorrel draws from the study of law, philosophy, and ethics to answer the difficult questions that arise in times of war and contemporary conflicts, including uh, our current challenge of climate change. To that end, we hold events, conduct research, and produce publications that educate the public and decision makers on vital ethical and rule of law issues. This morning's event is a breakfast coffee talk with uh, Professor Claire Finkelstein and Senator Angus King, uh, independent of Maine. Before we get into that discussion, I must do some housekeeping. First, there will be Q&A towards the latter half of this program. To submit a question, please use the Q&A feature that will be found on the ribbon at the bottom of your window if you are on a desktop. Please keep your questions topical, appropriate, and rated PG. Anyone posting inappropriate language or content will be removed from the session. I know many of you are lawyers on the call today. For lawyers seeking CLE credit, please remember to fill out your digital evaluation form and include the CLE codes that will be shown via the Zoom poll or announced throughout the day. The evaluation form is mandatory in order to receive CLE credits. There is one evaluation form per day. So if you attend multiple panels and sessions today, include all of those codes from today on the same form. And you will find the link to that evaluation form in the chat and you should have also received an email. The first passcode of the day is maple. I repeat, the first passcode of the day, very appropriate for the start of fall, is maple. So, turning to our main event, let me introduce Professor Claire Finkelstein. Claire is the Algernon Biddle Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And she's also the director uh, at the, of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. She is an expert in the law of armed conflict, military ethics, and national security law. She is the co-editor of the Oxford series in ethics, national security, and the rule of law. She's a frequent radio broadcast and print commentator and has published op-eds in numerous outlets, including the New York Times, Newsweek, and The Hill. Her prior scholarly work focuses on criminal law theory, moral and political philosophy, jurisprudence, and rational choice theory. And uh, with that, I will conclude and turn the floor over to Professor Finkelstein, who will see us through the end of this session. Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sander, and thank you uh, for everything you've done to make this conference a success. This is the culmination of a three-day conference on climate change, uh, the Arctic, and our national security priorities. Uh, and there is no better person for us to be celebrating the culmination of this conference with than Senator Angus King. Uh, so I'll invite Senator King to uh, engage his camera. Welcome, Senator King. Senator King sits on four oversight committees, the Rules Committee, Intelligence Committee, Armed Services, and Energy and Natural Resources. Uh, here at Searle, we have long been an admirers of Senator Angus King, who really speaks uh, with the voice that protects the rule of law, is always mindful of rule of law issues. And that is, of course, what the center focuses on. 
Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the Arctic and climate change and its connection to our nat national security. So I'm delighted to be joined by Senator Angus King. Welcome, Senator. Good morning, Professor. It's great to be with you. And I heard that one of your specialties was rational choice theory. Maybe you could come to Washington and spend a couple of weeks with us. That's right. <laughs> we could lose. Need also, I, I got to say, this is the first time I think anybody's ever gotten CLE credit for listening to me. So I'm, I feel like <laughs> I've sort of arrived here this morning. Let's begin by talking about your own trips to the Arctic. Uh, you've been there a number of times now, including in 2016 for a fact-finding mission to Greenland uh, with the Coast Guard. Can you tell us a little bit about the, those trips and sure. what your takeaway was? Well, my first visit to the Arctic was 500 feet below the, the surface of the Arctic Ocean uh, on an uh, American uh, nuclear fast attack submarine. Uh, I went up for a, a program called ICEX, where they do a lot of, it's a Canadian US program, they do a lot of ice related uh, experiments in science. And uh, we flew up to Alaska, then flew out over the ice, landed in a, a, a little plane on the ice. The, the, the uh, landing strip was marked by black garbage bags in, in rows, that was how you knew where to land. And then the, the amazing thing was to see the conning tower of a nuclear submarine crash up through the ice. Uh, and there were about six or eight of us on this mission. Uh, we got on the submarine uh, and then dove uh, and spent the next uh, 24 hours, uh, spent an overnight, uh, ate on the submarine, uh, met the sailors, uh, and then spent some time at the ISAX experiments uh, when we came back up through the ice, which was, it was really an amazing experience. And that was my introduction uh, to the Arctic, although I'm, I'm from Maine, so I know cold weather, but- uh, <laughs> That's right, not but like not that. quite that cold. <laughs> no, and then later, a couple of years later, I went to uh, Iqaluit uh, for an Arctic Council meeting. Uh, John Kerry was there, Secretary of State was there. It was a ministerial meeting, um, very interesting uh, experience. And one of the things that struck me was when you talk about the Arctic, we talk, and we will today talk about national security and natural resources and all that. There are a lot of uh, indigenous people up there. This is a, there's a whole civilization that uh, is very important. And as we're talking about these issues, that's gotta be part of the conversation. And then I think the most affecting visit that I had was to Greenland with the commandant of the Coast Guard. Uh, and we went out over the ice sheet uh, and ended up uh, at, uh, on the ice sheet, and there are these giant holes in the ice called moulins. And uh, into those moulins are flowing enormous rivers, what amount to rivers of meltwater. The water goes down a mile or two through the ice to the bottom to where the rock is, and it lubricates underneath. It's one of the things that's accelerating the, the uh, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. And of course the Greenland ice sheet, if you think about it, the Greenland ice sheet is really the last vestige of the, of the glaciers uh, of, the, of the ice age. And there's about 20 feet of sea level rise in the, just in the Greenland ice sheet. And it is, it is melting and moving uh, amazingly fast. The, I think I read that the, the loss of water right now is seven times what it was in the 90s. So, uh, we went to the Jakobshavn Glacier, uh, saw where it had been 100 years ago and where it is now and what's happening. Uh, it, it, it takes your breath away. I mean, if there's any doubt about climate change, I wish I could take all my colleagues up there just to right. talk to the people and, and learn about what's happening there. All the ramifications, the, the native people are losing their traditional uh, fishing and hunting grounds. Uh, the ice is disappearing so rapidly. Uh, and of course the ice in the, in the Arctic Ocean, two thirds of the Arctic of the ice in the Arctic Ocean has disappeared in the last 30 years. That's extraordinary. Uh, That's an extraordinary statistic. And uh, it's really hard to convey without having seen it the way you have, uh, how important this is. Why should Americans care about this? I mean, we are an Arctic nation only by virtue of the fact uh, that we have Alaska which uh, touches on the Arctic. 
Um, let me start with let me start with the particular and go to the general because I often get questions. Why is a senator from Maine caring about the Arctic? In fact, a funny story uh, about five years ago, six years ago, I was walking into the Senate chamber with Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Alaska. and I said, uh, I said, Lisa, I want to be the Arctic senator, and she said. No, Angus, you can be the assistant Arctic Senate. So <laughs> uh, she and I have been working on, on these issues together for seven or eight years now. But why care? Well, from Maine, just be, as I said, start with a particular. If and when, and I think it's only a question of when and how soon, the Arctic opens for uh, tr transit, uh, Maine is the first place a ship coming from Asia heading for the east coast of the United States will find a port. Uh, we're, the, we're the first place coming in uh, to the United States and, and we're a port state, we're, we're a, a seafaring state and we have uh, three great ports for containers, for uh, break bulk and for other, other kinds of products. So uh, that's our sort of particular interest. For example, just uh, about five or six years ago, Aimskip, which is a huge Icelandic shipping company set up their U.S. headquarters in Portland, Maine, and we're now shipping to the high north, to the to the to Iceland and to Scandinavia out of out of Portland. That's their principal headquarters. So it's a it's important to our state. But you asked the general question: Why is it important to America? Well, uh, let's start with strat uh, uh, strategy and and strategic interest. Uh, it's one of the places where we're the closest to Russia, and, and I'm gonna, we'll talk later about Russia's buildup along the Arctic uh, shore. So it has great strategic value. Uh, it also has unknown and uncounted uh, commercial and economic value in the sense of, of energy, of, of uh, rare earth minerals, which are becoming more important. Uh, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest there. And then the trade route part that I mentioned uh, it's, I don't, I've never gotten a firm fix on the number, but I think it's like 14 days shorter to go from Asia to the east coast of the U.S. over the top than it is to go down through the Pacific and through the Panama Canal. Exactly. So it, it's an important trade route. And, and, and you know, as, a, as the globe becomes more uh, uh, interdependent economically, that, that kind of thing is going to matter. So, it, it, and here's a good way to think about it. The, the, un, the opening up of the Arctic is as if we suddenly stumbled, stumbled upon the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> it's, it's the opening of a huge body of water that's never been open to human use uh, in, 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 our, in history, in human history. And suddenly we've got this enormous body of water that's fronted by eight countries, uh, has enormous strategic economic energy value and the question the ultimate question is can we manage to to this process of opening this uh, this ocean uh, in a peaceful and 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 deconflicted way I think a lot of people might say so what's the problem isn't this a great thing we're going to have new trade routes uh, we're going to save all this shipping time so why should we be upset about this why should we be concerned well, I don't, I, I, I don't think we should be upset about it, but I think we should, be, we should watch it carefully uh, because as I mentioned, there are eight countries, one of, the, one of which is Russia. Uh, and Russia has by far the largest shoreline and uh, has a historically a very high interest, something like a third of Russia's GDP comes from the Northern part of their country. Uh, their principal sub base is Murmansk. Uh, which is in, in above the Arctic Circle. Uh, so, and, and of course, uh, General Billy Mitchell said that, uh, that Alaska is the most strategic place on Earth. If you look at a map, the Bering Strait has to be one of the most strategic places. And then going over to the other side, uh, the uh, GI, what they call the GI-UK gap, the uh, Greenland, Iceland, UK is, it's, it's how, if there's a conflict, that's how the Russian Navy will get out into the, into the Atlantic, into the rest of the world. So it's, uh, it's an area, that, and, and, and we don't really know fully what's up there in the way of energy or, or important uh, resources. So it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly important region of the world, and we're just now sort of figuring that out because it's literally been in the last 25 or 30 years that it's become uh, open to uh, exploration and 
and transit and all of those kinds of things. So let's let's talk a little bit more about um, the potential for a clash, either a Cold War um, spiraling uh, sort of competition with Russia or even a hot war uh, in the Arctic. And I think we have a slide to put up, slide number four, uh, if my team can put that up to show the audience uh, of a slide that will show us uh, something about, you know, how there Russia is. sees its interest in the area. Yeah, what you see on this slide, those white uh, rectangles are uh, Russian military facilities. You see Greenland on the left. This is a sort of an unusual view. We're looking right down at the North Pole. You see Greenland on the left and uh, uh, lower left and, and Alaska at the upper left. And then all the shore along the right hand side is Russia. And you can see the level of military uh, buildup that they have undertaken. Uh, and I, I have to say that uh, most of it is def defensive, uh, but uh, there's no such thing as a weapon that is only defensive unless you maybe you, you know, a fortress. But the the uh, it's a uh, it's a worrisome development. They've clearly uh, militarized uh, to to a significant extent uh, that region of the world, and so uh, that's why, for example, the the submarine that I was on, the undersea capability that we have, is one of our it's one of our asymmetrical advantages, uh, but it's it's very important. So I think you know, I mean, it, and and I, I want to emphasize most of these developments are defensive, but uh, they don't necessarily have to stay that way. So it's it's uh, it's a matter of uh, of, of some uh, strategic concern if there was a conflict. And and of course the other problem you have in a situation like this is the danger of an accidental conflict, right? Uh, that that spirals out of control, sort of the guns of August uh, situation. Uh, and wherever you have uh, adversaries facing each other, uh, you just worry about a young you know pilot making a mistake or uh, and something happening. So that's, that's, that's the importance of that region militarily. Senator, are these bases, um, is this a recent development have they, uh, or how long have they been there? To the best a lot of it is recent. Uh, I, I can't put a number on it, but they've, right. they've had uh, military presence up there since the Cold War. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of additional development. And I, I ought to mention, we're, we're focused right now on Russia. Uh, China has expressed a significant interest in the, in, in, uh, the Arctic region. I, I was, I've been to a couple of conferences, which I recommend highly, by the way, in Iceland in the fall. They have a conference, uh, I don't know if it's happening this fall, but uh, it's called the Arctic Circle. And uh, President Grimson of, of Iceland started it about 10 years ago. Great conference, but I'll never forget going. And there were like 40 people from China there. And I thought, well, that, what, what's that all about? And, they said, and the Chinese said, oh, well, we're a near Arctic nation. <laughs> and my response to that is that Maine is a near Caribbean state. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I think we can take this slide down now. Thank you. Wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about the um, uh, Arctic Council, because when, when we discuss the possibility for competition with Russia, China, uh, other nations for natural resources, shipping, and a possible military buildup, um, we want some kind of structure, international structure, to help right. govern this. Yet the Arctic Council uh, the charter specifically prevents it from dealing with security issues. Uh, is that something that should be changed? And uh, if, if not, then what is the international body that should help deal and potentially diffuse some of the uh, tensions that can arise there? Well, as I mentioned, I went to an Arctic Council meeting a, a few years ago. I don't think it should be changed. I think one of its strengths is that military and, and, and security is is specifically excluded from its charter. And that means it's really an area, it's, it's, an, it's an organization that's, that's very effective and uh, I believe uh, important uh, to, develop, to, to dealing with Arctic issues outside of security in a, in a, a, a peaceful way. I mean, the Russians are members, uh, the chairmanship rotates around through the membership 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think putting security into it would change the nature of the organization. Yeah. The security question, there is something called the NATO Russia Council, believe it or not, sounds like a contradiction in terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's sort of moribund since the Ukraine invasion. But it seems to me that presents a, an opportunity as a forum uh, to deal with security issues. Um, five of the eight Arctic nations are in NATO. Two, uh, Sweden and Finland are Western oriented. And then, and then of course, there's Russia. So uh, I, I think that would be a better to try to resuscitate that which exists on paper as a possible uh, forum uh, would be you know, one, uh, one possible option. The UN could have some roles, bilateral negotiations between the US and the Russians. And I think, I think General Votel may have mentioned this earlier in the week. Syria is a good example of how Russian and US military can uh, work together is not the right term, can deconflict with one another, can communicate with one another uh, to avoid uh, conflict, particularly unintended conflict. So uh, I think there are opportunities, military to military on deconfliction, um, maybe the, the NATO Russia Council or some other forum. But I think the, the, the Arctic Council, I, I would argue, should be left as is. So let me just follow up on, on your last point. Um, you said that, that this, um, direct U, U, or NATO-Russia um, organization or alliance has been defunct since Ukraine. Uh, so what do we do now, in effect? Ukraine is still an issue. In addition, we have the hacking of the, of the US elections, continued interference uh, in uh, US elections. Do we go ahead anyway and ignore those factors and try to revive it, or do we just well, put it on hold? I think you, I think you have to take a, a, a sort of cold-eyed look at what what is to our national advantage, and clearly there there needs to be uh, international recompense for bad actions, whether it's election hacking or uh, or invasion of a of another country. On the other hand, having a a, uh, a method of at least maintaining communication. Yes. It seems to me, I, I don't think that's really rewarding Russia. I think it's just recognizing here's a region of the world where there's potential conflict, where we're in close proximity to one another. Let's talk. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't see yeah. that as, as saying, we therefore don't mind what you did in Ukraine. I just think it's a practical, uh, 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 practical alternative to a kind of, of total lack of communication, which I think is never is never good. As I say, I I think uh, act, uh, dealing with deconfliction and and you know what I would hate to see a couple of submarines run into each other or, yes. or you know something like that. That's I think that's pretty unlikely. But um, but there it, we just need some forum, and that I suggest might be one of them. Maybe we create another, uh, you know, a, a far north security council or something. But uh, right. I think there needs to be open lines of communication. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the convention, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, which uh, would potentially help to govern one aspect of this, which is the natural resources aspect. Uh, there is a, um, under this treaty, which the United States has signed but not ratified, uh, there is a 10-year period to make claims on an extended continental shelf, which would give exclusive right to the resources on or below the seabed. Uh, should the United States ratify this treaty, which is pronounced, I think, unclose? The answer is an unequivocal, emphatic yes. It's a huge mistake that we haven't ratified that treaty. There are around the world disputes being resolved right now under the treaty about uh, borders and and uh, you know rights uh, that you're suggesting, and we're not at the table. Uh, the problem is we've got a group of people in the U.S. Senate. Uh, oh, by the way, as as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm on the Armed Services Committee. I've been in you know, eight years of hearings on armed services and intelligence with all kinds of, of uh, military 
you know, high ranking generals and admirals, I, I quite often ask the question, do, should we ratify the Law of the Sea Treaty? I have, the answer is always yes, from our uniformed military. Uh, there's so a group in the, us? Well, what's stopping us is there's a group in the Senate now that think that anything with the name treaty is an abrogation of, <laughs> of sovereignty. Right. And I, what I've said to them, look, uh, you know, when a, 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 a traffic light is an abrogation of your sovereignty. It limits your ability, your freedom to go through that intersection. But we abide by it. You give up that freedom in exchange for the freedom to not get hit when you go through the intersection. And the homely traffic light is an example of, I had a professor in college who used to say, freedom through unfreedom. And so we, we're not giving up sovereignty, we're gaining an opportunity. A perfect example is the claims that Russia is making in the Arctic where we are not at the table and they're claiming, you know, huge swaths of the undersea and we're not there to, 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 to be engaged in that process. So the answer is yes. And I'm hoping that maybe if there's a change in the Senate and perhaps uh, uh, some uh, illumination on some of my colleagues part that a treaty doesn't, doesn't abrogate your sovereignty. It actually increases your, your ability to, uh, exercise your sovereignty. So that's the, that's the issue. I mean, right now there's, you know, I don't know, it takes 67 votes by the way, which is hard. It's hard for us to get 67 votes on what time it is. So <laughs> getting 67 votes on a treaty is really tough, but I think it's possible. And I hope that we'll, I certainly intend to continue to work toward that end during my, uh, right. my tenure in the Senate. Let's, let's talk about climate change more generally abstracting now from the Arctic. In how much of a national security concern is global warming, changing climate conditions, and what are some of the concerns that we should have when we put on our national security lens? Well, it was a couple of years ago, every year until about, I think a year ago, we used to have something called the Worldwide Threats Hearing, where the Director of National Intelligence, and I believe it was the top military folks would testify in open session uh, before Congress about what the threats that we face are. And uh, every year recently, one of those major threats high on the list is climate change. And uh, I don't think the administration liked hearing that. And so for the last year or so, we haven't had a worldwide threats hearing, uh, which I think is, is terrible. I mean, it, you're literally repressing information that the American people should understand. It is a major national security issue. Tell us um, why. And, and well, there, there are a couple of reasons. One is a sort of nuts and bolts, dollars and cents. We've got a lot of infrastructure, military infrastructure around the world and in the U.S. that's at very grave risk. Uh, Norfolk, Virginia is seeing what they call sunny day flooding right now. And that's where a great deal of our naval assets are. It's going to cost billions of dollars to uh, mitigate the effects of rising sea level at, uh, in places like, like uh, Norfolk Newport News, uh, but all over the world. Uh, but the real problem is what I call the force multiplication problem of, mm -hmm. of climate change. Um, throughout history, conflict has resulted from some shortage of resources. Uh, and the danger of climate change is famine, drought, unbearable temperature, which is going to set people in motion. To put it in perspective, the, the number of refugees from Syria that, that left Syria, went in to try to get into various places in Europe, uh, I think was between four and six million, maybe even on the low side of that number. And, and yet it turned the politics of Europe upside down and is, has been a terribly difficult issue uh, to, to deal with. The estimate of climate change refugees over the next, say, 40 years is in the range of 100 to 200 million people on the move. And where are they going to go? They're going to be going mostly north, and they're going to be going to temperate places, more temperate places. And that is a recipe for conflict. 
you know, it's, it's just, it, it, and, and that's what really worries me. That's the long term. And it, it isn't only, you know, sea level rise is part of it, but it's 130 degree temperatures in, uh, in the Middle East where people just can't live. Uh, and so how we deal with that uh, is, is going to be, I think, one of the great geopolitical challenges of the next uh, 40, 30, 40 years, and we're not prepared for it. I mean, my view is there should be an international c conference, particularly of the, I call them the temperate nations, uh, to talk about, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to build a gigantic wall, you know, across the Mediterranean? And uh, you know, I don't think that as we as we know, I don't think that's a very sensible solution. So we need to think about this. So yes, it's a destabilizing, the military would call it a force multiplier. It's a destabilizing effect uh, that's going to have worldwide uh, implications that, that we're not prepared for. Yes, and the whole issue of human migration as a national security issue, indeed a national security crisis, is something that I think that's only coming into view uh, the situation in Syria may, started to make that clearer. Um, but is, do you think that our military is starting to understand that and starting to deal with it in, in uh, national security terms? Well, the military does understand it. As I mentioned before, we had this hiatus of worldwide threat hearings. Uh, it was always on the list. And the military, they don't shy away from it. They understand it's a, it's a threat to their uh, integrity of their resources, but it's also a, a, uh, a potential uh, aggravator of, of uh, threats and instability. And, you know, that's, that's the, I, they're, they're doing more and better thinking about it than uh, some other people I might mentioned, but I won't. <laughs> um, let's talk about the domestic politics around climate change and how the issue plays out um, in our highly politicized sort of polarized world. Um, how do we get, you know, first of all, do you think that there is um, broad consensus around the importance of addressing climate change, or do you think it's still part of the uh, partisan politics and, and really, you know, hasn't gotten out into the general levels of concern that it ought to have? Uh, I detect a change. Uh, and, and let me just, you know, here's some evolution, starting with, with Donald Trump when he was a candidate called climate change a hoax. I think he blamed it on China, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, and then we went through the hearings for a number of his nominees and it was really funny because I sat in a lot of these hearings that there was a, uh, uh, you know, a, a mantra, a, uh, a script. And the script went like this. Yes, there's climate change, but we're not sure the extent to which humans caused it. That, that's evolution, you see. That at least says, okay, there's climate change. That's progress. And now I think we're getting a little even beyond that. This, uh, this past uh, fall, there was a very hopeful uh, development in the Senate where a, a group of us formed something called the uh, Climate Solutions Caucus. Mm -hmm. And it's entirely bipartisan. Mm -hmm. And it involves some people who you wouldn't expect. For example, the, the, to the co-chairs are Chris Coons of Delaware, not surprising, but the other co-chair is Mike Braun, who's a very conservative Republican from Indiana. And uh, we've had a series of meetings. We've had a series of briefings. Uh, we've had meetings with CEOs and, and some really interesting people. And I think we're getting to the place where uh, we're beyond that saying it doesn't exist or that humans don't have anything to do with it. I mean, the, the evidence is just so overwhelming at this point that it's, it's getting harder and harder to deny. And also, you know, senators are elected representatives, and in in our states, people are seeing it. I mean, in my state, lobstermen, for example, are catching seahorses in their lobster traps. I mean, that mm. never happened before. Mm. And and the the people, the forests, the people that work in the forests, and people on out on the water, they know it's happening just by their own eyes and ears. And that is getting through, I think, to my colleagues. So I, I think we're, we're making some progress. Uh, 
you know, the question is, is it to the extent of making decisions that uh, are of any significance as far as how we're going to deal with this? And, and uh, you know, as I say, sea level rise is, 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 is inevitable. And, and I don't want to bore you, but historically, what a lot of people don't realize, we think the ocean is as way it's always been. 20,000 years ago in Maine or anywhere, the ocean was 390 feet shallower than it is now. Shallower. You could walk, you know, from Brooklyn to, to uh, Hempstead, Long Island. There was no, there was no water there. So any, you look on a chart, anywhere you see anything shallower or, or, you know, that's 300 feet or shallower, that was dry land because all the water was locked up in the glaciers. Mm. So the glaciers started to melt at about 10 or 12,000 years ago, which isn't, you know, that's, that's human, you know, humans were around at 10,000 years ago. The water was melting so fast that at one period, there's a period called the meltwater pulse 1A, about 10,000 years ago, where sea level rose a foot a decade. Terrible. A foot a decade. We're used to thinking, you know, millimeters, centimeters. This was a foot a decade. And there's evidence that we're in that kind of place right now. Right. And uh, of course, that comes along with a whole host of issues, not just enormous human migration, but rising temperatures, rising insect counts, increase in diseases. Um, and don't forget, you know, don't forget New Orleans, New York, Miami, of low-lying uh, areas. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to talk about, you know, two or three inches, but al already, I mentioned this term before, but already in Florida and Miami, they're having what they call sunny day floods. Yeah. Not a storm, not a storm surge, just a high tide, a king high tide. And uh, they're spending already millions of dollars in Miami to raise streets and stuff. Uh, and it's... Uh, so the, the, the implications of, of significant sea level rise, and the point I'm trying to make, I don't want to be an alarmist, but when I went to Greenland, it was with two world-class world uh, climate scientists, one who specializes in sea level rise, uh, a guy named John Englander, uh, who's going to be publishing a book just in the next couple of months on this, mm -hmm. and uh, the possibility of abrupt climate change and abrupt sea level rise is very real. So one of the things that I'd just like to, to follow up on that, and that I wanna open our discussion to, uh, to the Q&A, is um, about how we communicate around climate. Uh, our conference today is co-sponsored not only with the uh, Polar Institute from the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center, but also the Annenberg Public Policy Center and, and their project is about the science of science communication. So how do we communicate around climate? Number one, so that we can take it out of the partisan, poli uh, partisan politics box, so that we are appearing to speak to everyone, uh, that it doesn't fall into the internecine warfare that we have on so many issues, but also how do we get people to understand the importance of science? Because that's what well, this is about. <laughs> that's that's a good question across the board. I, I right. <laughs> I, I have to say I, I'm I'm I, I'm always surprised and don't fully understand why this has become such a highly partisan issue. Yeah. When I came of age in Maine and used to work in and around the Maine legislature, uh, I, I was a lobbyist, if you can imagine. Uh, the leaders of the environmental movement in Maine in the 70s were all Republicans. Uh, this was a climate and, and environmental protection in particular was a, was a Republican issue. Uh, yeah. Ed Muskie, of course, was a Democrat. He was the guy that got through the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. But a lot of, the, a lot of this was, a, and, and, yet, and yet now it's become a defining kind of litmus issue and, and I'm always a little bit puzzled by that. I think it perhaps has something to do with the influence of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, but in any case, uh, it, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. It's, it's you know, it's, it's science. The, the fact that we're now at over 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, and we haven't been there for 3 million years, and the last time we were there, the ocean was 60 feet higher. I mean, that's, we, we don't, we don't have fierce debates in the in the uh, Senate about 
pi. You know, it's 3.1416 right. all over the world. But, you know, we're debating things that really are uh, so the, the evidence is just getting to be more and more overwhelming. Uh, and we've really got to, uh, we, we've got to confront it. And how you communicate, I, I think I noticed that you went to Yale Law School. I think at Yale, there's been a project about literally on the subject of how do we communicate about climate change. I think one of the most important things is, is that people understand practical you know, reality. And if you tell them that, you know, what's going on out in the Gulf of Maine or in the forests or the foresters are seeing uh, bugs they've never seen before, that certain tree species are growing better than others. Uh, you know, all of those things I think are starting, people are starting to say, hey, what's happening? And then when you look at the data about CO2 and the the, uh, the, the enormous growth of the amount of CO2 that we're putting in the atmosphere, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to, to, to refute at this point. Unfortunately, we see such a suspicion and a refusal to accept the deliverances of science, even with respect to a disease, uh, an infectious disease that has killed over 200,000 well, Americans. We could, so. we, we could spend a couple of days talking about the the decline of the respect for the for science, yeah. uh, and you you know I made some fun of you at the beginning about rational choice, but yes, uh, and, like, uh, yes, sorry, Senator. Well, part of part of the problem, and I don't want to take this too too political, but part of the problem is I found uh, I was governor of Maine for eight years. Now I've been eight years in the Senate. I found that a, if you have a complicated public policy problem. If you can establish general understanding of the facts, yeah. getting to the policy solution is usually fairly easy, believe right. it or not. But if you don't have understanding of the facts spread broadly among those who are making decisions, including the voters, it's almost impossible to reach a conclusion because people have different, vis different versions of reality. And you know, we're in a country now where we have what I call the balkanization of the news business and the phenomenon of, of uh, confirmation bias where we all seek out news sources that we agree with. Right. And the problem is we've got people with very different views of reality. And, and the media, and I, you, not, I'm not complaining. I mean, this is free, free speech, free press. I understand it. But uh, it's really, uh, you know, there are people walking around in our country that have a totally different view of what we're talking about because right. they're getting, you know, a, a different, a different reality. And, and, and that's a real problem. I don't know how you deal with that, uh, except to continue, you know, people like me have to keep talking about it and hope that we're, we're going to make some headway. And I think the other thing, Professor, is that, that uh, it's getting to be the point where it can't be ignored. Right. I mean, you know, when the, when the mailman notices that he has an extra month of slogging around in the snow, Yes. Uh, or, or, you know, it's, it, it, how hot it is in, in October instead of in August. That's when it's, people are going to start to say, hey, something's happening here. And then the evidence of, of human causation is, is so clear. Right. Science does have a way of coming and biting you on the nose. We have a yep. bunch of questions in the queue. So let me, let me tee up some of these questions for you, Senator, if you don't mind. So the first question is, to what extent might the next NDAA contain increased funding for Arctic domain awareness, such as sensors, communications, mapping, et cetera, and which services might support that funding and which might oppose it? I don't know specifically whether there's additional funding in the bill. I know that the, the services are taking this very seriously. The Air Force, for example, just released a new Arctic strategy this summer. Uh, we've been after all the services uh, on this issue, and uh, the Air Force has taken it seriously. The Navy issued one a few years ago, and I think they're in the process of updating that. Uh, there's a lot of attention to our military presence in Alaska, uh, and so I, I think there's additional work going on, but as to the specific question about additional funding for mapping or that kind of thing, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, is something I can find out if the if the person who asked that question would like to follow up and send a note Good. to my office. Uh, we'll okay. Try to get them an answer. Wonderful. Another question is: 
Um, what do you see the role of technology in addressing challenges in the Arctic? Uh, what are some of the promising paths forward and would any be problematic? Well, let me start with a big piece of technology, uh, which we don't have, which is icebreakers. Uh, we have one icebreaker, one operative heavy icebreaker, one medium icebreaker, and then we have a third heavy icebreaker that's essentially being cannibalized for parts. That's it. The estimate is the Russians have something like 40 icebreakers. Uh, and while, you know, I don't know exactly what the right ratio is, I don't think it's 40 to 1 because the icebreaker is the fundamental infrastructure of, of the Arctic and will be for some time. Even as the ice melts, uh, there's still a lot of ice and, and there's still uh, icebergs and it's still a, a treacherous place. I don't think we're going to see significant commercial use of the Arctic route, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, although every time I say that, more ice disappears the next year and it looks more likely. The northern route along the Russian shore is already, uh, I think it's getting pretty close to being uh, uh, commercially viable and, and the Russians are making money by uh, helping ships get through there. But um, in, in terms of technology, certainly we'll have better technology. If, 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 if it turns out that there's energy uh, exploration, um, I'm not sure it's, it's imminent because of the price, the cost. Uh, the price of oil is now pretty low. It has been for quite a while. Uh, I don't think it's, at least in the short run, going to be economic uh, to do, do much oil and gas development in the Arctic. But when it does, certainly, hopefully, we'll be able to, to do it safely and, and understand. I, we have a wonderful lab in Maine, uh, Bigelow Lab, uh, uh, on the coast of Maine that is, is or has been studying the, the different challenges of doing oil and gas exploration in an in a Arctic climate. Uh, you know, what happens if there's a spill? Does the oil act differently? Those kinds of things. So uh, there's, there's certainly an important role for, for technology in, in, in that sphere as in all others. Right, then, then we have a question. Uh, we don't usually identify the names of the people asking questions. Um, but in this case, it is from someone who was a Trump nominee, and he says that he gave the standard response on climate change that you uh, cited earlier. He, and I will quote from his question, I am not dug in on this, and I have great respect for you and your views, but from my perspective, that was the truth. I really don't know the cause. I certainly see the evidence of climate change that you discuss but I really am not certain that it is caused by man. Why is it not simply part of the normal warming and cooling that occurs on Earth? Well, I think the acceleration is one part. I mean, it, it, the, the average, if, if you look, I mean, that's, it's true that there has been a normal uh, sort of sine wave of, of, of uh, CO2 but it's, it's ranged, as I recall, it's been a while since I've looked at the chart, but historically, I mean, on, in the millions of years time, it's ranged between, I think, 180 and 280 parts per million, somewhere in that band. And now we're at 400. I mean, we're so far out of the norm of any level that in, in several million years that it's, it's hard to say that, that, that it, this is just normal uh, rising and falling. Uh, and the same thing goes for the release of methane, uh, the release of CO2. The, uh, the, the, what we're seeing corresponds with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. I used to have a slide that I used that showed, you know, the amount of CO2 released per year, and it starts in like 1720, and it just, it's just a hockey stick. And uh, I just, I just don't think there's any way to argue that it's not, uh, it's not caused by our dumping millions and billions of tons of, of uh, gases into the atmosphere that, that trap sunlight. Um, and at this you could point, re, you could reproduce it in a lab. And at this point, how much of a difference would it make if we could settle the causal question? Well, that's uh, a really I, good. That's a really good question because I think we're beyond a tipping point. I think uh, we need to do everything we can to, to reduce the amount of carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere. But uh, a lot of the research, and I've been on committees, we're trying to fund research on carbon capture 
uh, and, and carbon sequestration. Uh, it's not enough to just stop. If we stop tomorrow, all emissions, we'd still be in, in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. So the technology of capturing carbon when it's produced, but also pulling it out of the air right now is, is just hugely expensive and, and unfeasible from an economic point of view. But that's the prior question about technology. That's where we're putting a lot of money in the Department of Energy and a lot of research money into uh, carbon capture and carbon sequestration because you're right, just uh, stopping, uh, not digging a hole any deeper uh, still leaves us in a hole. That's right. Now, when you say we're past the tipping point already, so then there's, you know, the opposite side to climate denial, climate change denial is sort of climate fatalism. Well, so we're past the tipping point. What can we do? There's nothing we can do. No measures that we take are really going to make a difference. Uh, what would well, you I, say? Think there, I, I think there are a couple of answers to that. One is uh, mitigation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, building up a assets that are along the seacoast, uh, uh, making the levees at New Orleans uh, somewhat stronger. I mean, that's, that, that's not giving up. That's taking account of reality and, and reacting to it. But the other is what I mentioned, and that is uh, research on uh, how do we uh, reverse <clears throat> the problem is the, the residence time. It would take, as again, if we stopped altogether, I, I can't remember the numbers, but it's in the decades of, of, of that, the, that the gas stays in the atmosphere. Um, We've always had, I mean, there's always been CO2. If you think about it, what, what's, what we've really done is we are releasing in a very short period of time, a lot of CO2, a lot of carbon that's been trapped under the earth. The, the, uh, the, the, car, the, the oil that we're using comes from flora and fauna uh, from millions of years ago, and it's been under the earth. We're taking it out. And that's what's adding. That's what's adding to the volume that we're having now. So right. uh, I, I think we, technology can help us remove carbon from the atmosphere and also help us to mitigate the most drastic effects. Now I have two more questions and we have just time to put them in, I think. Um, first question is, how do you incentivize American businesses in the natural resource extraction sector in the Arctic? since you are worried about China's ambitions in the Arctic. So how do we, and, and you might take that question more broadly, I think as well, how do we incentivize American businesses to reduce their carbon footprint? Well, those are two very different questions. I heard the first question is how do we incentivize American businesses to, to do uh, natural resource extraction in the Arctic? And I don't, I don't know that I think that's a good policy. Good thing, yeah, that is a very different uh, question. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's economic for anybody up there right now. It's going to be very interesting. The, the administration, as you know, is they're supporting uh, drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And the interesting question is, are they going to get any bids? Uh, is the, does the industry think it's worth going after at current oil and gas prices? Uh, the, the economics of it may, be, may limit the, the drilling as much as the prior regulatory regime. Um, so that's, uh, I, I, I don't really, I don't think I want to incentivize right. extraction up there, uh, at, at least not in the current. I, I, I think we may be at a place, to be honest with you, and, and I guess the, the viewer might not agree with me, I think we're at a place where fossil fuels days are numbered anyway. Yeah. Uh, the big, the big breakthrough development is going to be energy storage. Uh, renewables, particularly solar and wind, the, the wrap on renewables is intermittency. Uh, you want the power to be on when the wind isn't blowing or when it's dark at night. So the question is, how do you fill in the gap? Right now, in most places in New England, for example, it's almost all natural gas. So mm -hmm. the natural gas plants spin up and then they go down when the wind and, and, and that, that's the balance and it's mostly natural gas. 60% right. of our power in New England comes from natural gas. When we can figure out the technology of storage to make it economical and competitive, then we don't need fossil fuels. And you combine that with the electrification of automobiles. If we can have an all renewable grid 
and electric automobiles, that's two thirds of the carbon budget of the US. Uh, the other third is space heating and industry, which can be dealt with in other ways. So I think the, the to me, the real green, green New Deal is energy storage. That's it's not right. as exciting, it's not as sexy, but uh -huh. that's the, that's the, the biggest uh, uh, thing that we can do uh, in order to get us to a green economy. Well, that's very important to think about. Um, I have one last question here, which is in terms of infrastructure, is Alaska ready to take on additional military and commercial activities to beef up national security in the area? Well, I think so. And, and one of the things we didn't mention is that we really, I think, I think there needs to be the development of a, of a significant port infrastructure uh, probably Nome, right. Alaska is the place where that should go. And I think there, that, that is a, there is an infrastructure need. I mean, there's a lot of military activity now, and there are a lot of bases. I've been to several of them in Alaska, but uh, I think a port, uh, a significant port infrastructure uh, in, in, in Alaska that can serve the Arctic is, is one of the infrastructure needs that we, uh, that, that we need to attend to. Right. And then what about the general question that I incorrectly tacked on to the other question, which is how do we incentivize businesses to, to really address the climate change issue in their own backyards? Well, I, I think it's already happening. I mean, it, it, it's hard to tell, but you see the Amazon ads where they want to be carbon free in 20 years right. or something like that. Uh, and, and I think a lot of businesses and, and, you know, business to, the, to, to a business, this is an, this is an economic problem. I mean, they, they need to look ahead and say, what is going to be the cost of, of, to us and, and how is this affecting our customers? And, and I think that's happening. I think things like incentives for electric cars make sense as a mm -hmm. kind of transition strategy. Uh, and and uh, support of renewables and those kinds of things, but but you know, renewables are now cost effective. Uh, and uh, for for example, the cost of solar per watt, a solar panel, has gone from like seventy dollars a watt to I don't know where it is now, about ninety cents in in twenty years. I mean, that's huge, and that suddenly makes it. It's no longer something we got to do because we want to subsidize it and create everything. It's happening because of economics. And uh, I, I can go into a lot of detail, but we need to, I think we need to talk about uh, decentralizing the grid, having uh, what they call distributed generation, where you have generation in smaller units, maybe on a rooftop. Uh, and figuring out, to talk about technology of integrating that and, and, and making the grid secure. And yet at the same time, having things like demand response, instead of, instead of turning on a big plant, when you have a peak, you send a signal to all of your corporate customers, uh, we'll pay you to sh turn your air conditioning down five degrees, mm -hmm. and it'll meet that, that peak by demand response, instead of uh, simply always saying, well, we're just gonna have to burn more fossil fuel to make more electricity. So right. uh, that's uh, the, the whole issue of the grid and the efficiency of the grid is, is something that's, that's, uh, that's, that's very important. And, and I, I think there need to be subsidies and, and incentives here and there, but I think it's happening already of its own accord. Uh, business wants to succeed and uh, they, they're viewing some of these issues now as cost of doing business that they have, to, they have to figure out how to deal with. Senator, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, we may not see any more presidential debates um, prior to the election. We may, but um, but we will likely have a vice presidential debate next week. If you could ask one question on climate to the vice presidential candidates, what would it be? Wow, I haven't. I've never thought of that. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I have a solution to the problem of the first debate. A really. Yes. It's a very simple one. Give the moderator a mute button. Well, exactly. And the debate if the, commission. If the rule is you have two minutes. Right. And you're not supposed to interrupt your, your opponent, your adversary, just give the a mute button and, and your mic goes off for two minutes and then the other person gets to answer. Uh, of course, about, and the, de the debate commission is uh, apparently itself debating whether or not to, to use a mute. 
<laughs> I, I interestingly enough, I used to moderate debates in Maine when I worked for public broadcasting. Did you? So I moderated George Mitchell and Bill Cohen and all kinds of people in those days. In fact, one of the reasons I got into politics was I figured my questions were as good as their answers. So why not try it myself? Anyway, I don't have a good question for on climate change. I think it would simply be uh, something like uh, the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, the cost is already uh, creeping up. Uh, what, what should we do? I think the emphasis ought to be, what should we do? Which are the very questions you asked me. And, uh, and perhaps the vice presidential candidates will, will agree to address that question next week. I, 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 certainly hope, I certainly hope so. And you know, if you had a, a, an enforceable format where there really was two minutes or a minute or whatever it is, you, you, you could, the, you got to supply some information in those two minutes. You, you, you're, exactly. you can't rely on all this crosstalk where nothing really gets out. I think it would, I think it would put a unique kind of pressure on the candidates to have to look into the camera and, and say, here's what I would do about climate change uh, and spend a couple of minutes doing that. Uh, it would test whether, whether they, A, understand the issue and B, have thought about it. Wonderful. Well, perhaps they will take your suggestion. Senator King, I'd like to thank you so much. Your, your knowledge in this area is extraordinary. Your commitment even more extraordinary. We're so grateful to you for all the incredible work that you're doing in the Senate and also for your willingness to speak with us today. I'd like to thank my partners in this, uh, the Annenberg Public Policy Center and the Polar Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation and I hope you will come back and see us again, maybe sometime in person uh, when and if this pandemic ever ends. Uh, we will be delighted to welcome you to University of Pennsylvania Carey School of Law. Thank you, delighted Thank to be you. with you. Great questions, Thank thanks Professor. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.